Hi, everybody out there. Welcome to Women Rocking Hollywood. This is the WonderCon at home edition of Women Rocking Hollywood. It was actually going to be our first year actually at WonderCon. We were very excited, but as we all know, it was not meant to be. So here we are all at home. Everybody, all these wonderful directors are at home and they're joining me. They're joining me for this wonderful get together. We're just going to hang out. So all you guys and gals who were not able to see this in person at WonderCon, you can like go get coffee or a glass of wine or some popcorn or something, settle back, pet your cat or your dog or whatever, and get comfy and then spend like an hour with us and learn about their new projects and all about what they're doing. And it'll be fun. It really will be. By the way, I am Leslie Kamal. This, this particular time, I will remember to introduce myself. I am Leslie Kamal. I uh, have a site called Cinema Siren, where I write film reviews. I also write for the Alliance of Women Film Journalists and for the Motion Picture Association's The Credits. And I have a site called Women Rocking Hollywood, and I started this panel about five years ago. So this is our fifth year at uh, San Diego Comic-Con. And if you want to see former panels, you can go onto YouTube and find them there. So as I introduce you guys, just say hi and you know a word or two. But she broke through in a huge way last year with Rust Creek that was a sleeper hit and actually a wonderful movie. And you can see it on Showtime right now. It was actually on today. That was exciting. <laughs> So you can see that movie. Uh, and Thank then you. Thank in addition you. to that, yes, in addition to that, she just directed, you had your di directorial debut on the small screen with The Purge. And coming up this summer, which we will have a trailer for, uh, is Twi The Twilight Zone. So you did, you, she did an episode of The Twilight Zone. So welcome, Jen. Thank you for having me. Of course. And C. Fitz, known as Fitz to her friends and pals. Um, she wears a lot of different hats. She's a film director and producer and writer, and also um, a media expert and does uh, a lot of online stuff. She's won four Webbies for her digital work. And then you did um, a movie uh, documentary, which you produced, co-wrote, directed, um, called um, uh, Joel's Catch One. And we will also have a trailer for that. And then it got picked up for distribution with Array. And now it's on Netflix. So people can watch it right now on Netflix if you want. And then you just um, did your episodic debut with season four of Queen Sugar. And you have some stuff in the works. Yeah. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Happy to have you also. So Homily Culpepper, who you may know, you should know, because she is, she broke, um, Big, a big record for being the first woman to direct a pilot for in the 53 year history of Star Trek with Star Trek Picard. But she's also done feature films and she's done a ton of uh, small screen stuff, including The Flash and uh, Criminal Minds and Gotham and Grimm, all shows I watched actually, um, and American Crime. And she's actually one of the inaugural directors on with uh, Reframe Rise, the, the mentorship program for directors. And she just worked on a pilot for the reimagining of Kung Fu, which is very exciting and she will talk about. And she's working on a, a feature you're attached to um, about a couple that was enslaved and escaped called A Thousand Miles. I'm happy to be here and excited to be part of my first WandaCon panel, even if it's virtually. I just wanted to share a little thing for the Star Trek fans. Actually, where WandaCon usually is when it's in person is where we shot quite a few scenes from Picard. Oh, that's so cool. I love hearing that. That's a nice little tidbit. That's wonderful. Okay, and Rosemary Rodriguez, who I have known for a while and love. I'll, I love all of these gals, but I, I'm so glad that Rosemary can be with us. She has uh, awards as a writer-director for Indies, Acts of Worship, and Silver Skies. And on the small screen, she's done a really, really lot of stuff, including The Walking Dead, and Jessica Jones, and Rise, and The Good Wife, and lots and lots of credits that I could go on and on, and you can check on IMDb. But more, more recently, she's been on, um, she's directed for Apple's Dickinson, and Truth Be Told, 
and uh, she's the exec one of the executive producers on Apple TV Plus, Home Before Dark, which I watched the whole season and love, 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 and you guys totally need to watch it. And she's attached to a psychological thriller set in the gaming world called Intrusion and Creep Show on Shutter TV. Hi, thanks for having me um, with these awesome other women. And I'm actually looking forward to the virtual panel because I think there's going to be um, an intimacy to it that maybe we wouldn't have otherwise. So I'm looking forward to hearing from everybody. So before I start going into the questions, I just want to take a, a few minutes to talk about women in film and reframe. Every year that we've had a, a Women Rocking Hollywood panel, reframe and or uh, women in film LA have been part of the panel and they've been incredibly supportive of Women Rocking Hollywood and of women, women in film and female filmmakers. It's really um, they've made such a huge difference for women working in the industry and they have tons of amazing programs, not least of which right now is um, a page full of resources for people who are struggling through the pandemic, having trouble finding um, financial resources or um, mental health resources. There's lots of things that as a, a filmmaker that you can go on there or just, you know, for research or to just make yourself aware of the kinds of things that they're doing. They have that. Um, with Reframe, Reframe is um, a joint venture that you can check reframeproject.org. Uh, and it's a project that is really trying to go out into the world and do as many, make as many changes in as many platforms as possible to make the difference for women in film. And what they've done is they have all of these ambassadors and um, insiders in the industry who have gotten together and they have a reframe stamp, which if a show or film meets the criteria, then uh, it gets a stamp and it's about inclusion and gender balance. So when they get that stamp, it means as a, as a film fan or as somebody who loves TV, you can feel better about knowing that you're probably going to see some better representation in front of the camera and behind the camera, which is so important. Um, all right, so Jen, we're starting with you. You run Glass Elevator, as I mentioned. What is it? Better, better said than I can. And how does it help filmmakers and film goers? Um, and how is it evolving? I right, thank you. I do. Um, so I started Glass Elevator four years ago, uh, and it was called something different then. It was called Film Powered. Um, and then about two years ago, I partnered with a company called Level Forward, um, and we relaunched as Glass Elevator. Um, and what it is, is it's a community of over 4,000 women, um, all professional, vetted women in film and television um, from across all of the job spectrum. So uh, there are PAs, there are executives, there are lawyers, writers, art directors, um, even film critics. So it's from script to criticism, uh, yes. And um, it's a free membership-based community that provides peer-to-peer -peer classes, social events, and jobs. Um, so the, the purpose is to strengthen the skills and strengthen the relationships of women in the industry so that we can support and elevate one another together as we're growing our careers. Um, it's very important to me that women last in this business um, it's important to me for political reasons in that I feel that our voices are important and they are disregarded and they have been historically disregarded. I happen to think that's contributive to the state of the world. Um, important for me personally, um, because when I go to a job and I'm the only woman, I'm not safe. There's a target on my back. I want to be surrounded by people like me um, by people who respond to the material that I respond to so that, you know, I don't look like an alien. Um, so that, that's why I started it. And um, in terms of where we're going, we've, we've held over 250 classes and events that have been attended by over 3,000 women. Um, and I think there have been about 500 jobs that have been posted to the site. And all of them have to be paid because women should not be working for free. <laughs> Um, so that's what that is. And um, as for progress, um, we're working really hard behind the scenes to launch some new tech that's going to help everybody continue building those relationships, getting those jobs, 
um, adding to their skills in their toolbox and um, also finding a way to open it up to more aspiring members while maintaining um, the more advanced professional members that we have long had. And I think it's important to mention too to those uh, aspiring filmmakers and filmmakers out there that it is free. It doesn't cost anything. Oh yes, it's free. You know, membership is free. All the classes events are free. That's extremely important to me because um, I don't think whether you can afford to pay for a membership should determine whether you have access to something. And especially in our industry where sometimes you're up and sometimes you're down, it doesn't affect your talent, your skill, your ability to contribute. And, um, you know, look, depending on the ethnicity of the woman, they're making anywhere between 25 and 70 cents on a dollar to a white man. I'm not gonna change them for a tool to try and change that. Right, exactly. Okay, great. Um, so last year you released Rust Creek, which was a, an and a sleeper hit, which was very exciting. Um, how did that change the trajectory of your career? Uh, it was great because it was actually my second feature and I kind of thought some of this response would have happened to my first feature, which was also very successful in terms of critical acclaim. Um, but for some reason it didn't just, it didn't really hit for my career. Um, and that, that was a hard, you know, that was a hard pill to swallow there. You know, you think you're gonna make your first feature and you know, everything's gonna happen. And then you go, wait a minute, I gotta make another one? Um, so I did, and uh, this one did it, and I'm, I'm over the moon. Everybody loves it. Um, I'm getting, well, first of all, I got phenomenal representation that I love and who are very capable and most importantly, understand me and what I'm trying to do with my career and believe that that is possible. Um, that's all very important. And um, it's been great. I'm getting in the right rooms. I'm meeting the producers, the production companies, the studios and the networks that value what I do. That sounds great. Um, so can you just give like one example from Rust Creek since people have access to it now and they can go watch it and so it'll be cool for them to hear about it. Yeah. Uh, where you feel like the female gaze or a perspective that maybe hasn't been shown before was represented in your work. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, I want to point out Rust Creek has the reframe stamp. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it's something that you feel. It's something that you feel in the material. And, and, and that's important to me because I think the difference between a good director and a bad director is all kind of in the wrist. And so it's very hard sometimes to talk about directing in terms of gender because people want to say, oh, women do this or men do that. I kind of don't subscribe to that. Women can be bad or good, men can be bad or good. Um, but the, the perspective that we come to the material is always going to be different because we're treated differently in the world. Um, and, and that's what I bring to the material. So for example, um, and, and, you know, one of the things I love about making movies and making TV or whatever is that uh, you always have this experience, someone that you've never met, you have no connection to in the world, an audience member will come up to you and say something word for word that you said two years ago in a pitch. And to me, that's like, that's, it's magic. It is literally magic. It is the most phenomenal, exciting, pleasurable thing on the planet. And I'm getting, I'm answering your question, I promise. I'm getting <laughs> to the point that is in the first fight scene in Rust Creek, uh -huh. um, it's highly tense. It was very important for me. Um, so, so it's about a young woman who, for those who haven't seen it, it's about a young woman who gets her first uh, job, big job interview in DC over, over Thanksgiving break. She drives uh, by herself through Appalachia to that job interview and you know, uh, uh, stuff goes down uh, in the process. So she's approached by two guys and uh, she's uncertain, you know? She recognizes them in terms of types, you know, she grew up in the area. So, you know, they're a little rough around the edges, but they could be fine. Um, and it ends in a fight. And, um, you know, a couple of things were important to me. One was, it was important to me to capture that energy of, and every woman knows this, something is not right, but the social mores have not been crossed to the point that it justifies me responding in the way that I wanna respond. And that was extremely important for me to capture, and I think that I did. Uh, and secondly, it was very important to me that she was not a superhero. You know, we show in the very first scene that she's athletic, 
she's strong, she's confident, all those things, but she's not a superhero. So the way that manifested to me is when I spoke with the stunt coordinator, I said, look, this is what I want to see, this is how I want it to feel, but I only want to use actions that she could have learned in some silly self-defense class in college. And this is one of those scenes that everybody comes up to me and tells me those things that I said in prep. Um, you know what and, else and that, one of the things I really love about the movie too is that her costume, her, she's not wearing booty shorts. That's no, a huge no. thing. I know, and that was so important to me. I'm like, guys, she is driving over Thanksgiving weekend on her own in a, in a junky car. You wear sweats. Stained it's sweats. Yeah. yeah, totally, totally, totally. Um, well, yeah, I love that. So um, you recently made your uh, directorial debut on uh, in Blumhouse's The Purge, and now yeah. you have an episode coming up of the new season of The Twilight Zone. Uh, what can you tell us about your episode, the cast, working with the producers, and any, anything else you think fans would want to hear because it's very exciting to be working Oh, my God. I, I am over the moon. I have been so... Okay, so it took me literally decades to get to work in television. Um, but now I am like having the best time of my life because I'm getting on all the coolest shows that I love watching. Um, so I, maybe it was worth the wait. I don't know, we'll see. But um, so yeah, so my episode, which is episode 207. So that's the seventh episode of the second season, uh, which by the way, comes out, we're coming out this summer on CBS All Access. So my first episode was The Purge for Blumhouse. And that was, I am just so profoundly grateful to the people who hired me on that show. Um, because as we all here know, it's incredibly hard to get your, your first opportunity in television. Um, and that really kind of blew the doors open for me. Um, for The Twilight Zone, it was a really funny, funny uh, experience getting hired actually, because I, I was, my, my rep, uh, emailed me at like two o'clock on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And it was one of these weeks where I was just running around from meeting to meeting to meeting to pitch to pitch to pitch. And they're like, hey, they're interested in you for Twilight Zone. And I was like, what? Um, you know, they're interested in you for Twilight Zone. Uh, can you either uh, do a call tonight or uh, meet in person tomorrow morning? I think it was just before Thanksgiving. Um, so, so that's why the, the timing was essential. Like it had to be those two days. And I'm like, uh, I, I definitely can't do tomorrow because I'm booked. So I guess it's a call tonight. And um, I, they were like, are you sure about that? And I'm like, well, that's yes or no, you know? Um, so I got home from my meetings at five. I read the script. We had our call at 6.30. And I was like, here are all my, my ideas. And they're like, okay, well, if you can come up with that in half an hour, I think you're good. And I was like, awesome. <laughs> on my episode, we shot in Vancouver and I got to work with Topher Grace and Kylie Bunbury. And if you don't know Kylie, she was um, Angie Richardson in Ava DuVernay's When They See Us. And she's amazing. Um, and then of course, uh, Jordan Peele, who was awesome, uh, does the narration. So the intro and the outro. Um, and he was really fun to work with. Um, they were great. And, and I, I am very curious to see how this episode is received. Um, because, because of Rust Creek, people tend to come to me for like feminist kind of ass kicking stuff. And, um, this is a rom-com. It's a rom-com gone twilight zone. So Fitz, we're going to talk to you. <laughs> so, um, your documentary, Jules Catch One is now on Netflix, and it was picked up um, for distribution by Array, and we have a, a trailer to show people. The Catch offered a place where any and everybody could come. The guys used to, to talk always about going out and catching one. That meant that they were going to go out on the prowl and try to pick somebody up, and that's how the name Catch One came into being. The catch was important because at the time that uh, we opened, there was still an abundance of, of racism. They tried to burn her out when they tried to buy her out, but uh, Jewel is my hero. Not only was she poor, not only was she a woman, 
she was a lesbian, and on top of that, a black woman. People of uh, different lifestyles were actually uh, ordinances against activities of same-sex dancing, of dressing in transgender clothes. The Catch One became a haven. Everyone is welcome to the biggest gay club on the West Coast because it's the best coast. Eventually, the celebrities came and the money came and the fame came. It's a fat club and it's a fat neighborhood. The early 1990s brought in people like Madonna and Sharon Stone and became an in underground place. It was great music and it was packed. The bangingest music, the most free-spirited people. You came here prepared to dance. There's such an eclectic group of people that come to this club. Men, women, black, white, all nationalities. When folks call and ask me what kind of club it is, and when it comes to sexuality, it's for gays, lesbians, bi's, tries, and otherwise. Can you explain to our audience what drew you to Jewel and her historic LA club and what you learned from the experience of filming and releasing the documentary? Uh, well, I met Jewel, the, the day I met her, I had already researched her and this amazing club that she had at the time for over three decades. And I was just wowed by what a presence she was, what she had done in her life and the story of Catch One which covers at the end, um, by the time I finished my documentary, which took six years to make, 42 years that she had this club. And I, I just, it was in my bones, like it is for uh, any indie filmmaker, storyteller, you just, you're so passionate about telling the story. Um, and I'm glad I was that passionate because it took a long time um, to make. And uh, I, I love how it came out. And then it took another two years to find distribution. So, you know, it was right from the get-go. I knew it had to be made and I wanted, it, it came out as an unwritten textbook. I couldn't believe that there wasn't more out there on Jewel Tice Williams and Catch One. It went through the AIDS crisis, police dis discrimination, uh, harassment. I mean, just the LGBT, I mean, it changed history just this on this corner of the world, which, the, the documentary actually helped Jewel. Um, she was named, uh, the corner was named after Jewel Tice Williams just recently, which was great. And uh, it, it was a, a lot of history that was going undocumented. So I just felt passionate to make the film. And fortunately at Urban World Film Festival, we traveled um, to many film festivals at Urban World. We met Ava DuVernay which was the tippity top of our list to distribute it. And we were fortunate enough to meet her and to Lane Jones, her president, and they uh, distributed it. And it's now on Netflix, dream come true. And we were just so thrilled. It was in the right hands, um, you know, for the subject matter, for the stories that we tell and what Array is all about, helping people of color and female filmmakers and shining a light on their voices. And, you know, that is what I was trying to do with my documentary, shine a light on this piece of history on Jewel Tice Williams and all her work. So uh, I learned a lot. Perseverance uh, is a superpower. <laughs> and I think to not give up on your passion uh, before taking on something like that or a passion project, just make sure, you know, you're, you're really passionate about it. And that you're gonna be in it for the long game because nothing's guaranteed. And especially nowadays, we don't know what's coming up, but it can take years, um, even if you make something quickly, it can take years for distribution or for it to get in the right hands. And now, you know, how we're going to even promote it in the film festivals and all that change, it's just gonna be a little bit of a different world out there. We were fortunate enough to do the film festival circuit with Jewel with Jewel's uh, Jewel Catch One for a year and a half, and that really helped shine a light on the film and get it out there. And like I said, that's how and where we met Ava and Tulane. So yeah, perseverance. And, 
<laughs> and then, well, I mean, and it's such a wonderful movie. I love it so much. I'm so glad it's out there because there's so many stories that were, are starting to be made that really, whether it's narrative or in documentary, that I think is lending a voice to people that we should know who they are. We should know about them, which we'll actually bring that up with um, Hanali as well, because she has a, a, a feature film that she's working on, on a story that a lot of people don't know about that's amazing. So um, this did sort of lead to you um, being in a director on Queen Sugar, which was your um, debut at, you know, on the small screen as a director. How did that happen and what was that experience like? Ah, well, the Ava effect, as it's called, um, Array and Ava taking my documentary and distributing it, uh, that got me into being an Array filmmaker in that family. And I, I always wanted to direct on Queen Sugar. Um, and I, I asked her, I was actually shadowing her on When They See Us and brought it up there. Uh, I feel strongly about, you know, getting any and every experience you can. I was fortunate enough to um, be able to shadow Ava on When They See Us. It was, it was an amazing experience. And um, I, I put my name in the hat. I didn't have representation at the time. And fortunately, we're living in a time where Ava DuVernay exists, where, you know, you, not every director on Queen Sugar does have representation. She still considers them. She looks at their background and what they've accomplished and she gives them a shot at directing episodic, which I was fortunate to be one of those. Uh, 32 out of the 35 directors, it's their episodic debut on, for television. And I've done a lot of things, but I couldn't crack that. It's, it's hard to get your first shot, as Jen mentioned. It's nearly impossible, and even to get your second. You know, it's a, it's a big hustle game, especially if you don't have representation. Uh, yeah, I was a showrunner in Unscripted and I couldn't get an agent. So I, I feel very fortunate to be a product of the Ava effect, to have been given the opportunity to direct a Queen Sugar episode in season four. It was an amazing experience. It was beautiful. They have a great cast as everybody knows and crew. And, you know, it, it was, I had a very emotional, a really emotional episode, one of the biggest in uh, the season uh, at that time. And a lot of different pairs of talent were going through these big emotional swings. And I was so excited about directing all of it. And uh, it was just a blast. And so uh, now you have, you've been, um, during the pandemic, and I don't know how much you can talk about this, but we had talked off screen about the fact that you're actually working on something specific to uh, the pandemic that through your marketing and doing mm. commercial work. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, and I think it's interesting to bring up to any filmmaker going forward. Um, I come from commercials, marketing, I, I've done work with different companies and networks, and they came back to me uh, knowing that I had that working relationship because their promotions have to be different. You know, they can't bring all the talent into a green screen studio or even uh, any studio for the day. So they're trying to figure out how they can promote different shows, uh, different films um, with people still at home safely and creatively out of the box. So fortunately, uh, you know, I, I get to toss my name in the hat and we'll see. I got to pitch, you know, several ideas, which is a lot of fun as a creative and um, we'll see where it goes from there. But my point bringing it up to other filmmakers and creatives, I think we have to keep that in the back of our head as we're making and shooting stuff, especially indies, because we're gonna have to use certain things to promote potentially in the future. We're gonna have to maybe do both simultaneously, possibly. Um, and we're gonna be working probably with skinnier crews sometimes as well. Yeah. So, so there's that, and it's given it's given some time to actually really harness some of the creative that I'm working on. The uh, it's given extra time, as Jen mentioned. You know, we're we're sometimes shooting and then taking meetings and prepping. You know, hustling, trying to get your next show, reading scripts uh, that you're not working on that day, and this time has allowed me to single focus on certain projects on certain days that that has been uh, you know one of one of the blessings if you could call it such 
And so you, you mentioned literally about 10 minutes before we got on here that you are we're working on something on called the Kill Club. The what Kill is Club, that? yes, the Adaptation of Kill Club. It's I mean, yay. Uh, officially announced. I'm really excited. It's a feature, scripted feature coming out, Adaptation of the Kill Club by Wendy Hurd. And, um, you know, it's given us, we're now in casting. And uh, something that I have noticed, I'm attached to a couple of features. This time is... Um, has allowed us to develop and cast. People have time to actually read, which has been which has been nice, and you know, time to sort of develop and really hone the script. And that's what we've been doing on a couple of my features. And that one just got announced, which is great. We're really excited about it. And of course, you know, all these things need more to go with it, including a cast, which we're working on. And what's it about? Oh, it is about the broken foster care system. And we're shooting here in East LA. And, uh, you know, a lot of lower income communities really get hammered in the foster care system. Some, some people take on kids just for, you know, it's a thousand bucks a kid. And it's something that really hasn't been talked about enough and, and shown in the light of entertainment enough. And there's, there's a whole vigilante that comes, you know, you think to be the good guy. Um, but in essence, it's really based, it's a, it's a love story. It's a love story uh, for a main character for the son and a love story for herself in the end. Does she love herself enough to make the right choices uh, morally, ethically? It's a beautiful, beautiful script. I'm very excited to also be celebrating East LA and um, the culture there, the music. We're going to really have a blast and we're very excited. Sounds wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. So, Hanali, um, first off, congratulations on, you got to introduce a film for the AFI Film Club, didn't you? Yes, yes. That was, yeah, today. <laughs> I know, that was exciting. Yes, Josh, thank redemption. So um, on Picard, uh, being the pilot director um, and having worked on the first episodes, you got to make a lot of choices um, that were kind of kept through the entire season. So first, I know we, you and I had talked about casting, which I think is really cool. And I think that Star Trek fans will think is cool. Um, first, talk about hiring Issa Briones as Soji. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Issa, the, the, that character was going to be tricky because we needed her to be vulnerable, but be able, but tough, be able to handle the action sequences that were going to come, have a really good chemistry with Patrick Stewart because there was, you know, a parental thing happening. He practically was basically a godfather uh, to her, if you want to call him that role. And so with Issa, what was great is she just brought this wonderful emotional quality to it. Um, she comes from doing Hamilton, and I'm a huge Hamilton fan, so I was excited about that. Um, but yeah, she just brought this really great emotional uh, take that we thought was wonderful. And we did chemistry reads with Patrick, and um, she just blew us all away. And, and her face is also, her face just lights up on screen. You know, you gotta, just she's luminous. It's, uh, um, you know, you're kind of like, Kate is. She's so beautiful and perfect on screen. And it does have an, 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 an uber, an, an extra human. Yes. <laughs> which, is, which actually also helps because, because ultimately, you, you know, you find out she's an android. It's like, yes, if someone was creating an android, they would be, you know, perfect and flawless. <laughs> which is good. And a little tidbit for, as I was doing research, for Star Trek fans, she's it, she is a singer. She was in Hamilton, and she is the person who sings "Blue Skies" in the in the show. So when you hear that, and you will at some point, it's her voice. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, talk about Allison Pill and Dr. Girardi, and and um, how she was. You know, we had talked about you casting her, and then I started watching the the show, uh, some of her interviews, and she is really funny. You're right; yeah. she's really yeah. funny. Yeah, we, we um, what was interesting with that character on the page is you wanted to have that humor, but my fear, because I was always trying to make Picard feel distinct from Discovery, is that that character could potentially feel too much like Tilly. And so you wanted someone who could capture the humor, 
but um, make it feel different um, than what Mary does. And so what we loved about her was that she has a maturity to her. You know, there's a, there's definitely feels like there's, she's had a history, but she was funny. Um, and, and I was looking at my notes again and actually what, what really helped sell it was that she had posted on Instagram um, a play that she was in. Um, God, I wrote it down to, um, uh, what was it? Oh, uh, Three Tall Women. She'd been in that play and um, with, with, a, with another actress named Glenda. And when we told Patrick Stewart that, he was like, well, if Glenda likes her, she's fine with me. But yeah, she brought that perfect kind of combination of bringing humor to it, to the, to the role, but also, you know, as you find out, there's pretty, a lot of darkness happening with her character. Yeah, I like that she's walking that really weird fine line between, yeah. like, you know, she's very, she's unpredictable. She seems, yeah. she's got something underneath the surface. I think a, a lot of the characters have this sort of undersurface kind of thing going on, which makes it so compelling to watch the whole show. Yeah. Um, I think that Mike, Michael Chabon just, you know, he really brings in all kinds of layers and history to all his characters. And one thing that we requested when we were in rehearsals was to get like a little bio on them so we could know more of what was in his head as far as what had happened with these characters. Wow. Well, then you know more than we do, probably. <laughs> um, what about um, Evan Ivagora, who plays Elnor? Yeah, so he actually was a model in Australia and had was working on the movie Fantasy Island when he sent us our audition. And it just turned out that my friend was producing it. So I called her to find out how is he as an actor and how is he as a human? Because we really only wanted, you know, nice people on this. And she said, he is so great. And so we had um, some notes to give him, some adjustments. So I had a great phone call with him and um, he nailed it, you know, on his callback, which was great. Um, and I want to go back to East for one thing, because one thing that was interesting, the cast doesn't get like the whole story when they're auditioning. They didn't, they didn't even get the whole script and they got fake sides um, because everything was so top secret. So Issa had no idea that the character, what she was auditioning for was going to die in the first, <laughs> in the first episode. And then, you know, for most of the series, she was another character. So that was actually a very interesting turn to learn after you've been cast that actually, you know, this character is actually gonna die soon. And I remember when we shot her death scene, which turned out to be the last scene that we were shooting for that character. And it was actually, you know, some grief for, for me and for her because um, that character had been such a huge part of all of the prep, the creation for Picard. And, um, and now it was time for her to inhabit Soji. Cool. Um, so you um, had a lot to do also with the character design and specifically we talked about Romulans mm -hmm. and their costumes and their ships and also the Borg, but um, all of that is really sacred to Star Trek fans. I can speak for that because I, as I told you, I was a, Spock was my first love. Um, so um, how did you decide how they look and um, what was the process? And before we do that, we have a clip. So we're going to show you a clip that you directed with Romulans in it, and we'll be right back. quite a few fight scenes and some of them were the character of that Issa plays her fights and then these are they're, you know they're Tal Shar they're um, trained police and so I wanted the fight sequences to feel different and with this one I wanted it to feel just more brutal than some of the other ones because you had 
these trained fighters fighting each other. Um, I also really wanted to play around with it being more backlit. And so that's why you'll notice that there is no lighting there except for the fireplace. And um, that was a challenge for my DP, but <laughs> he, he made it great. And I think it makes it really cool to have it that way. Um, and so I also used a different camera style. I went full handheld. I wanted this to be more visceral, very cutty. Um, and so that, those were some of the key decisions that were part of that. Another thing was that um, when my editor showed me the cut, he had no score in it. And I was like, you know what? It's actually really, really great without score. You're so used to having music to help punctuate it. And I was like, but do you think, do you? He's like, yes, do it. It, it works. I'm like, is he so? I'm like, no, but the, yeah, do I? And I was like, okay, I'm going to turn in my cut without score. We'll see what the producers think. Because I thought it really did work better without it. You didn't need it. And as you know, in the series, it, it, it doesn't have score. I think they never even attempt to score it because it worked um, so well. So that's kind of, those were some decisions that I specifically brought to this fight scene. Oh, one other thing that's key about that fight scene, you know, even thinking about like what Jim was talking about with her fight scene, um, is with Patrick Stewart. You know, with his age, he cannot be super strong taking on these Romulans. And so when I was working with the stunt coordinator Scott, one thing he kept doing was, you know, I, I was like, I just, I'm not believing it. Now he's too physical. We've seen him walk around with a cane. We've seen him move slowly. He can't all of a sudden pick up this Romulan and, and do, you know, knock him out. So um, as we kept uh, developing this fight, that was one thing that I was like, mm, no, still too much. No, still too much. <laughs> um, and we came up with something we agreed on and then Patrick Stewart started, he's like, Mm, I think it's a bit too much for what I can be able to do. So I was like really happy he hadn't seen that earlier version and I was glad that I kept fighting for it less and I felt like we, we ended up in a place that really felt like something his character could do. We still wanted him to be a hero. We didn't want him just to be, you know, to do nothing in this scene and have them do all the, you know, do everything. So we found that nice balance with that. And then um, as far as talking about the look of the Romulans, so, you know, you really work with all of this stuff is, is such a collaboration, right? So you have an amazing team of people. We had Christine who did costumes, Jeff who did props, uh, Neville who designs um, the, the characters, and James who does makeup. And they are all Star Trek uh, fans. And so they bring their history and knowledge and you know they like I'm wearing my my Romulan necklace that uh, Neville designed. This is the the hero uh, combat that Jeff designed, and it's just a, always a matter of going back and forth. And in all our creative meetings, we we would look like okay, what look at what's been done before, what was done in the next generation, what was done in the movies, and you know everything was a choice. With, you know why we picked this costume over that costume. With the Romulans, you know, we wanted, you know, we didn't want to have the exact same look that the Romulans had in the next generation. Um, we wanted to, you want to have a more cinematic feel to it, right? So it was Neville bringing up designs and us looking at them and saying what we liked about one and not the other. And, you know, even decisions on, you know, what should, how far back should the hairline be? How should the ridges be? How should the ears be? You know, and going back and forth. And of course, all of these decisions then have to be approved by Alex Kurtzman and his secret hideout team and also by CBS All Access as well. Um, so that's kind of how the Romans came together with the Borg. It was really like, you know, what would they look like if all of their instruments were dug out of them, right? And also we felt like the Romans don't care about these guys. So it's not going to be a careful process, right? They're just, they care about the technology. So they have to injure them more to get that technology out intact, that's what they're gonna do. So that's why they're very scarred and, and look very bad. And then even with like, when you look at Hugh um, and his, the way he healed, we even made the choice that his technology was removed um, earlier. So he probably is a little bit more scarred in his face than some of the, the boards that you may see later. Um, and then with costumes, Christine had this really awesome idea to riff off of Alexander McQueen. Oh. And so we had uh, various uh, uh, layers, levels to the Romulans. 
And as you became more higher echelon Romulan, your costume got even more wild. And then we were tied up with Neville in like the wilder hair. And it was really cool. And so then I'm shooting this. And I'm just like, I want to see all these people. Like, where can I, you know, I have the one scene, I think in, uh, uh, that's in episode two, where Soji's about to enter the gray zone. And that's the scene where we mixed in, you know, Romulan century, Romulan, uh, we call them unique. Um, and what's interesting is you make all these decisions and things move forward, but then as the writers are working out the script, they decide, you know, you know what, we don't really need as much of the Romulan unique. And all of a sudden you're like, no, I only have like four of these guys. I used to have like 20. <laughs> so the, the necklace that you have, is that a prop or is that something people can buy? And that brings me to, because everybody... Any Star Trek fan wants to know, did you take any props? Could you take any props? Do you have anything from your work on there? We got to know. Um, okay, so I don't think you can buy this. Mm -hmm. Neville made this special, you know, I want to say special for me, but I think he probably made it special for quite a few people. Um, I do think that they may have provided something like this at Comic-Con last year. And they also provided um, a, a, a badge at Comic-Con. Um, I am not one to take props unless they're very, you know, like you get a special flyer printed out and, and but I did, I, I'll just show you. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> this is exciting. Ooh, the suspense. I did not take this. It was given to me by a prop master, but I do have my Chateau Picard wine crate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cool. <laughs> that is wonderful. Thanks for showing that. Yeah, so I wouldn't have cool. been able to do that unless, if, if, you know, we're at home, so I was able, like, to grab that. Was, was... <laughs> did you get a bunch of wine, too? I did get a bottle of wine, but I think it was empty. Yes, so this, this is a prop. Sadly, it is empty, as you can maybe tell by do the light. It is empty, but this was one of the props. But also, it was given to me by the prop master. I did not steal it. <laughs> Wonderful. So you have two things coming up. Um, you were just actually working on um, Kung Fu right before the shutdown. Um, mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about how it's been reimagined and why it's important and valuable as a, as a show and how that's going. Sure. Uh, so yeah, Kung Fu, um, what's really cool about it is that it is being reimagined with a Chinese uh, young woman at the heart of it. And we still bring in a lot of the spiritual messages that um, they had in the original series. Um, but, you know, bringing in some great action um, fight scenes, some really great dynamic between the family. And, you know, ultimately, I feel like it's so great right now we, to have this Asian representation. And I just feel like we need that show right now. You know, we, we um, Asian uh culture was very exciting right now they were having such great inroads with crazy rich asians uh, we've lost you know fresh off the boat is no longer on the air so there's really there's space for for one and i think that right now the way the world is acting with you know coronavirus i think that they need to be uh reminded and see people as as people you know humans as humans you know and supporting each other which i think yes. is what that character is about it's about yes. Um, kind of communication and interaction in ways that are new and fresh. At least that's the, what the old show was like. So, um, and then just going to mention that you have uh, two episodes of Nosferatu coming out this summer. Yes. Um, and and so you can mention that briefly, just a little bit about that, and then um, and then I'll mention just um, that you you have a feature that you're working on too. So talk just a little bit about Nosferatu and the feature so we can just get a sense of that. Sure. So um, last year I did one episode of Nosferatu. It was this crazy action-packed episode with um, a fire, uh, a house basically catching on fire and, and um, the lead characters trapped in that fire. So it was very logistically hard to do. And, um, and it came out very well. And so um, my punishment for doing a good job is that they gave me basically an episode that it was like the, you know, the Thomas Bourne episode, but TV, uh, TV budget and a TV schedule. So um, one episode is um, 
tons and tons of action, but it's also Rashomon. So you're seeing it from various perspectives. And it came out really great. And it ends with this emotionally um, just, you know, hard hitting thing that happens. And Ashley is the actress who does such a great job. And that takes us into the next episode, which is more of an emotional episode. Um, so that will be out in June. And then um, I'm doing the feature A Thousand Miles, which is about William and Ellen Craft. And so they're two uh, slaves who escaped because Ellen was uh, fair enough that she could pass as white. So what she did was dressed up as a white man and traveled first class. And her husband um, traveled as her slave. And they, um, and so it's a kind of, it's an action suspense thriller uh, movie about their uh, journey to freedom. And it's all true. And it's all true. <laughs> it's all based yeah. on something that actually happened in history. That's what is so yes. amazing. Yes, it is a book that, that, that we adapted. And it is crazy that um, you don't learn their story in the history books. So hopefully this will change that. I am so excited to see it. I'm so looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Hanalee, and thank you for showing us your props. That was exciting. <laughs> okay, so Rosemary, um, I would love to ask you a few questions. Um, so talk a little bit about The Walking Dead and some of the other shows that you've um, guest directed. Can you offer a few examples of how you used your aesthetic on those shows and what you learned um, as a director, just pick any of a couple of your favorites. I know you love and are close friends with a lot of the people on The Walking Dead, so, and there's so many fans of it, so, but whatever you want to talk about. I think The Walking Dead is always fun to talk about for me. Um, I was brought into that show in season seven, mainly by an actor that I know that was hired, and then he called me and, um, you know, we all get hired different ways, right? So I remember I walked in the door and I got a text and like, I looked at my phone and I'm like, somebody's like, hey, you wanna do The Walking Dead? And I was like, I didn't have their number on my phone. So I was like, my husband's in the kitchen and I was like, hey, somebody's asking me if I wanna do The Walking Dead, but I don't know who it is. Hell yes. Um, and then say, sorry, who is this? And so that's what I did. And it was um, Jeffrey Dean Morgan. And I was like completely embarrassed that I didn't have his number in my phone. Um, and I had worked with him on the, walk on the Good Wife. And so he was, of course, getting the role of Negan. And so then I called him. And then he told me he was going to meet with Scott Gimple. And did he want me to put my, na put, you know, my name out there? And so, yeah. So I was like, of course, The Walking Dead. Are you kidding? Um, so yeah, so I was really happy to go in there and also, you know, people are talking about the challenges of like the, you don't know what you're going to get when you're going to, you know, you get these months in advance, you get this slot and you don't have a clue what is going to be coming to you. But I did know because when I spoke to Scott Gimple within a couple of days of that um, call with Jeffrey, he called me and he did tell me that he was going to give me this episode. He said, and I've been waiting seven years for this episode. And I was like, oh, oh my God, that's like a nightmare. Like, how can I possibly do this? Like, that means there's so many expectations. It was just horrifying to me. I was like so nervous um, because I have everyone on a pedestal and I love the show. And to think about, you know, how am I going to possibly knock this out when he has something in his head that he's lived with for all these years. But it all went really well because there's amazing actors and there's amazing crew people that we work with. And, you know, we all do our homework. And so um, in that case, uh, working on Walking Dead, it's always um, really important to know what uh, is from the comic and what is not from the comic. So you have a reference with the comic and then, you know, it's, it's because the fans are so um, diehard fans and enthusiastic, it's like you want to pay homage to that comic because that's the fun part is comparing the frames and, you know, bringing that stuff to life. It's like what we do is take a two-dimensional, you know, piece of paper with black ink on it and we bring it to life, right? So it's the same with a comic. It's like, yeah, you have a drawing, but you're bringing it to life. So it's really fun to do that. Um, it gives another layer of, of excitement to it. But, you know, as, the, as shows go on in television, it's always a challenge because 
you know, people's contracts run out like every three years, the actors and stuff. So they need to get more money to stay enticed to do the same roles. And so a lot of the money goes to them and then less money goes to, you know, the production. And so every, the production tends to get squeezed a lot depending on the show, but when there's a big action show like Walking Dead and stuff. So it becomes challenging um, because you, think sometimes money's going to be thrown at you when you have big episodes and I think Hanley like mentioned it um you know that's not the case so you end up having schedules that are impossible and days that are impossible and you know you want to play ball with people to make things happen and you want uh to also not give away your work you know you want to be able to do all of it so um and you don't want to leave anything behind you know, when we have a schedule, and I think as a female director, um, you know, it's always about proving yourself. Unfortunately, the same for me, even though I've done 50 million, it's so hard to curse. Um, even though I've done so many episodes, every episode is about proving myself, unfortunately. So, you know, we generally have to come in on budget, and we generally have to make our days. At least that's the way I came up. Um, and so in order to get that next job, that's what you have to do. And so when you're talking about a show like The Walking Dead, and there's so much that goes in, the prep days are very long, you're making decisions um, because you need to move very quickly all the time. And the gift of all of that is that the instincts are always like right there. And so, you know, there's no time to waffle at least again, for me, I would just say for me, I don't, everyone has their own style, but for me, it's like, do just decide, move on, decide, move on, decide, like you just got to keep it moving. And there's a certain gift that comes with that because the instincts, my instincts are very sharp and I've learned to trust them. And I also have learned that when the end of the day, for me to agonize over anything that happened that day, it's like a waste of time because the next day there's going to be something else to agonize about. So it doesn't really matter whatever happened in the day is supposed to be what happened in the day, whether you were rained out, whether, you know, some actor, it just anything that happened, you know, they, they there's like, a, they have a toothache and they're on set that day and it's miserable or whatever it is. Um, it's exactly the way it's supposed to happen. So I think it's really, that's, that's what I love about doing um, television. Uh, the movies I've done have been very low budget, so it's really the same thing. It's like, make a, cast the right people, make a decision um, as quickly as possible. And, you know, I think that if I were to go, well, anyway, that's it for that. <laughs> that's wonderful. So I want to say that the fans of The Walking Dead I know, you know, everyone has their fans, but the fans of The Walking Dead, I think are reflective of the cast and the story and the writers because it is the biggest hearted group of people. And I say that the actors are the biggest hearted group of people I have ever met in my life on any show. They are, they show up, they work hard, they get in the dirt, they smell the way you think they smell, like they are just in it, gritty, and they will show up for each other when they know somebody's doing a hard stunt or a hard emotional scene, they will take their day off and they will come by just to hang out at the monitor for support. And they do that and we're in season 10 and they are still those kind of people. They are an incredible group of people and that's really how you accomplish anything Great. And somebody else mentioned, maybe Hanley too, like only want to have people that we like to work with. And I think that's, um, that's not a luxury that most of us have um, when you get thrown around. So you uh, now you've been working with Apple. That was wonderful. I loved hearing that because as you know, my husband is a huge fan. So, and he's big hearted and I, I yes. Walking Dead fans are wonderful. Um, you have been working on some projects with Apple and you work on Dickinson and, um, and now you're working on um, Home Before Dark, which we have the trailer. I'm Hildy Lisko. And I'm a reporter. This is for the people who don't believe in you. My dad's a reporter too. You're back in town? Just got in. You two know each other? It's been really nice and quiet around here. This is a warning. 
Where have you been all day? At the crime scene. Crime scene. When he left, your dad said he would never move back here. How come? In 88, the mayor's kid went missing. They never found out what happened to Richie. Is that dad? My best friend. He was taken right in front of me. I want to see the police report for Richie's life. Can someone deal with this? I'm not going away. I can't show you everything, but here's what I got. Are you helping me? I don't like when they pat me on the head either. Young lady. You have no idea what you're getting into. I feel like being called a young lady should be a compliment. But it never sounds like it is. What did you do? I'm a journalist. No, you're a fourth grader. There's a town full of people that know more about my husband than I do. I think there's something you should know. Run into that home. I know you cut school to interview a murder suspect. No. Well, yes, but no. Run into that home. In our family, we work out our problems together. Be smart. I'd rather be brave. Be both. You are executive producer on this, and you directed three episodes, the last one, and several in the middle. And what I love about this show is, I mean, they couldn't have planned this, but it's so perfect for what's happening right now because it's this kid who has really adult things that they have to go through and deal with. And it's really what's been happening with a lot of kids out, you know, with the pandemic. So it's a really interesting time for that to be available. It's on Apple TV Plus. So if anybody has that or wants that, and you should because there's some really good shows on there. Talk a little bit about that project and um, why you think it's such a good, and it's already been renewed for, for the second season. Yes, it has. Um, yeah, Home Before Dark is a story that uh, is based on Hildy Lysiak. And Hildy is a real journalist. Um, when she was eight years old or nine years old, she actually, so her parents, Live, she lived in Connecticut. They were there during Sandy Hook. They moved. Um, and when they moved, her dad was a reporter for New York paper. And so when they moved, she did her home paper that she did. She did it now in the new town and quickly uncovered there was an accidental death that happened in her neighborhood, in her town. And she started talking to the neighbors because she's a reporter. And she uncovered actually the truth that it was a murder. And so she is an astounding young woman with a very confident voice. And so it was perfect um, time all around to be telling a story like hers of, you know, we're all trying to get our voices out there. Well, there's somebody who's, you know, nine years old, who's like on CNN, like as a journalist. And she's in the Association of Journalists. And, so to take her and then have Brooklyn Prince, who was the star of Florida Project, play her um, was, was perfect because Brooklyn also is a very co strong, confident, very instinctive young actress um, and not a typical actory actress, just a real person who still loves to play but is curious enough to you know, and in love with the world around her and people around her to sort of be a sponge and take it all in and not, and be fearless in expressing that voice. So that was sort of my connection and why I wanted to be on the show. And as the universe would have it, I think, you know, I think it was great of um, Dara Resnick and, um, and Dana Fox created the show. Um, Joy Gorman Wettles like put it together. And I think it's, it's, it's a, and Apple, you know, Apple, I think to get behind a show like that, that's very challenging to think about making a family show. And particularly with an eight year old lead that you think adults are gonna watch. That's totally a big challenge to try to put out there. And I think it's risky. And I think the way the universe has it, again, everything happens the way it's supposed to, that this time it, it literally started streaming in the beginning of April, April 4th or something. And what perfect time to have families at home right now 
streaming everything, but they can watch it together. And so it's turned into one of Apple's most successful shows. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's a great thing for young women. Um, I think it's boosting Brooklyn. I think it's boosting Hildy. And, you know, these are young women that have a lot to say in the world. And I would like to think that, you know, Brooklyn's already directed something for Facebook. Um, she wants to be a director. It's actually the most, like, it's really moving little short that she did. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing to think about where they will be able to go with their lives, I hope, um, versus where the opportunities that I've had to really fight for so hard. So I think, you know, it's great. And I think Apple's doing great work. So I'm, I'm a fan of, of them. Apple is doing great work. Thank you so much. Um, Jen, you texted me in the middle of this and said you just found out that you're working on something that you just got approved and can yeah. announce. So what? Yeah, like, like hot off the presses. So um, uh, we've been working on this for a while, but there is a graphic novel called 200 written by a woman, uh, Jennifer Brody, and a, a created by artist, Jules Rivera, who did Spectre Deep Six. And the book's coming out November 10th through pub, uh, Turner Publishing, and I'm attached to direct the feature. And it's, it's really cool. It's, it's about, um, it's set in this world where, you know, in the future, it's a sci-fi, where um, no one dies. However, they discover that around age 200, people's brains start breaking down, like they can't kind of deal with it. So everyone at age 200 has to get tested. And if, if they're not, you know, if they're not um, 100%, they're basically culled from the community. And the movie starts when this woman, her husband has just been taken in for testing and she's going in uh, shortly. Well, I just want to thank everyone for being part of this wonderful conversation. And I would uh, urge all of you guys who've been, and gals who've been watching this and listening to us uh, to follow everybody on their social media and uh, to try to support as much as you can. So thank you all for watching. We so appreciate it. We hope to see you at WonderCon next year and at Comic-Con next year and keep, keep safe and uh, try to find some joy today. Thank you so much, everybody.